And we're live. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan Schumacher. Welcome to Bible Geeks, the, uh, the kickoff episode, uh, Guidelines for Reading and Interpreting the Bible. So the idea behind the Bible Geeks class in the first place, it's running in parallel with the sermon series of the First Presbyterian Church of River Forest in the fall of 2017. And we're following along in that sermon series on covenants. And we want to be able to really dig in as part of this Bible study course. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really important was to put together kind of a guidelines for reading and interpreting the Bible. Uh, this is stuff that people dedicate their lives to. So people write big books on it. I have a few of them on my wall back there. People are professors of what's called hermeneutics. Uh, and so we're not going to be able to get into uh, all of the possible nuances. But there's uh, some things that I wanted to share that I think are just really helpful. And, uh, and I wanted to have that be part of this class. And as I was preparing to do that for uh, the first week, I realized that this was going to take more than an hour if I was going to do it in the classroom. And so I thought I would do it as a supplemental video uh, that people could go and refer back to later if they wanted to. So the Bible Geeks Guidelines for Reading and Interpreting the Bible. Once you start, oh, clicked in the wrong spot. Oh, and we're skipping some slides. Okay, so uh, operating assumptions. So, we believe that the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments, are inspired by God, complete and correct in the original writing. As such, they are to be believed in what they teach, obeyed in what they require, and trusted in what they promise. The scriptures are for everyone to read, so that through the work of the Holy Spirit, all may hear God speak to their hearts and minds. Uh, so, this is from our church's website, the First Presbyterian Church of River Forest. This is part of our What We Believe. And, uh, and this goes through all of what we're about to talk about. Uh, the reason it's important to put this out there is the starting point in approaching the Bible is critically important. Uh, what do you say that the Bible is? Um, as much as it would be great to be able to say something like, we want to just believe the Bible, what the Bible says, uh, the problem is, if there's one thing that postmodernism, for all its flaws, did get right, uh, it's that every text has an interpreter attached to it. And so when I read the Bible, I see certain things that are different than what somebody, say, in Africa reads, or somebody coming from a secular worldview reads. Um, and so if we say something like, we want to get our understanding of the Bible from the Bible, the problem, you may see the problem there, it is a little recursive. Uh, because you have to know how to extract those principles from the Bible in order to apply them to the Bible. See what I'm saying there? So if you want to say, I'm going to derive my interpretive principles from the Bible, you have to read the Bible to find that. Well, how do you understand what the Bible is telling you about interpretation? You have to interpret it. It all comes really down to a starting point. Where are you going to start? Are you going to start with the idea that the Bible is the scriptures of the Old New Testaments are inspired by God, complete and correct in the original writing? Or are you going to do what many secular scholars do and say this is a work of human literature and we're going to study it the same way we might study uh, Shakespeare or Homer? Or uh, you might approach it as a collection of human wisdom that doesn't necessarily correspond to reality itself. Uh, you have to know where you're starting. And we start as believers from the uh, point of view that this Bible, which claims its own divine inspiration, is what it says it is. Uh, and in some circles, that's controversial. Uh, and you know, somebody might be wondering, well, how? If it's all about the starting point, how do you pick one? How do you know where you're actually starting? Isn't it just arbitrary? We can believe whatever we believe about the Bible. Um, no. And the analogy that I'll use is a tent. Uh, so, you got to put your stake in the ground someplace. If you've ever put a tent up, you know that where the tent goes is all contingent about where you drive that first stake. Where are you going to drive the stake into the ground? Uh, after that, everything pretty much falls into place. Okay, well, the base of the tent is only this far, so the options for where the next stake can go down are pretty constrained. Once you put that stake in the ground, then you have other ones which are even further constrained, so you've got all four down. And then the height is predetermined by the tent. So really the only choice you have in the matter 
is where does that first stake go? So you pick your stake in the ground. Where am I going to start? But if you've ever put a tent up before, you know sometimes you put the stake in the ground and you say, whoa, that didn't work. There's no way this tent is going to stand on this ground. The ground itself is too crackly and the stake just won't hold and everything starts sliding. Uh, the ground is too hard. I can't put the stake in. If I put the stake here, the slope is so steep that when it rains, it's going to soak everything. So the question is, when you put your stake in the ground someplace, does the tent stand up? Uh, can you test that, uh, that view of the Bible for consistency? So and you might have heard people call uh, certain methods of apologetics something called presuppositional, uh, which is sort of this idea that everybody has a worldview. Everybody approaches life, in, including that the Bible, uh, with a particular set of assumptions. And we believe in Christian assumptions. Others believe in non-Christian assumptions. And if we're coming from different starting points, how do you adjudicate the difference? How do you tell which one's right or wrong? And the answer is, which one is consistent? Which one can actually withstand life? Which tent will still stand up once all is said and done? And so, in all my study, I've come to believe that taking the Bible this way, the way that we describe it in our church, is the proper way. It's the only way the tent actually stands up. This uh, particular video, though, is not a defense of that proposition. Uh, you can find me if you've got three hours, and we'll, we can go through that. Uh, it's just, though, understanding that we are approaching the Bible from the perspective that it is inspired by God, completely correct in the original writing, and that is to be believed. But notice the qualifiers here. In what they teach. Obeyed in what they require, and trusted in what they promise. You see these things right here. They are both to be believed, but in what they teach. Well, what do they teach? Obeyed in what they require. Well, what do they require? Trusted in what they promise. Well, what do they promise? These are things that we have to extract from the text. Uh, in other words, how do we determine this? It's the task of the interpreter. Who's the interpreter? That's you folks. Uh, all of us are interpreters of Scripture. Uh, we believe ever since the you know, Bible began to be written, uh, translated into the language of the people, and the Bible began to be in the hands of the people, uh, every person who reads the Bible is an interpreter of the Bible. And so it's up to us, as responsible and faithful servants of God, to get into the Bible and to understand the claims that it's made. There's actually a lot of responsibility that came with the gift of Scripture in everybody's hands, because as soon as everybody has it, now you have all these other interpreters. I think it was the right thing to do. You know, the, we can go over the history of the Reformation if we want, but there were lots of things not going well when the Bible was only in the hands of a priestly class. However, there were a whole bunch of other things that then needed to be figured out once it was in everybody's hands, because everybody believed they could open their Bible and start saying, well, the Bible says this, well, the Bible says that, and maybe it says neither of those things. Uh, for instance, if we just take an example, let's run a test. Can Christians wear 50-50 fabric clothing? This may seem like a weird question. You may not have considered this as even a theological question before. Uh, but there's a text right there in the Bible. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. And in fact, if we get this Bible out here, I'll read a little bit more from it. Deuteronomy 22. This will also give you time to go get your Bible, as I'm searching for it. Uh, I'll be reading from the Holman translation. And if you want to know why I use that one, find me with another three hours. Uh, so, we'll back up. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 9. So, do not plant your vineyard with two kinds of seed. Otherwise, the entire harvest, both the crop you plant and the produce of the vineyard, will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Do not wear clothes made of both wool and linen. Make tassels on the four corners of the outer garment. Beware. The word of the Lord. Okay. So, can we wear a 50-50 shirt? Or any mixture, for that matter. So, this is where, you know, everybody is an interpreter there's going to be multiple reactions to reading this text. And there's a couple that I want to go over, and I'm going to venture to call them silly. Uh, these are going to be the silly interpretive angles, things to not do, and then we will get into the things to do. Uh, but silly interpretive angle number one, 
They will call it the reflex method. Well, Bible says don't do it, don't do it. There, that was easy. Uh, so what might the problem with that be? Uh, well, context is important. Uh, the Bible sometimes permits things that it prohibits or sanctions elsewhere. You could say the same thing about do not eat unclean foods. Uh, well, uh, you could open the Bible and you could find something that says, a, you know, you are not supposed to eat lobster, for instance. Uh, this has come up a lot in actually contemporary discussions about how much of what's in Leviticus or Deuteronomy do we actually believe to follow. Uh, and then you can go later in the Bible and you can go to, you know, Acts chapter 10, uh, and you can see God telling Peter to eat the unclean animals. And Peter's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I would never eat anything unclean. And God is like, do not call unclean what I've made clean. Well, hold on a second. Here it says it's unclean. Context matters. The place you are in redemptive history matters. The covenant that the particular person is under matters. So to know why the Bible says this in this place about the don't wear the clothing of wool and linen together, you have to get behind why is it saying that in this place at this time to these people to understand how to bridge the context to today. So it can't just simply be a reflex. Maybe right, I don't believe it is, but it may be right uh, because there's other areas in the books of Moses where we would say the rules do endure to today. Uh, in this case, I think it's pretty clear they don't, but it's not just a reflexive thing. It's like, oh, Bible says it. You have to pay attention to the context. Silly angle number two, I will call it the hyper-technical method. Well, since my shirt is a blend of cotton and nylon rather than wool or linen, it is fine. Don't do that. Uh, the point of the passage, as I read the whole thing, is about mixing two of anything. Don't mix different seeds. Don't plow with two different kinds of animal. Uh, to, you know, without going into the whole interpretive background here, the purpose is to differentiate Israelite monotheism from the polytheism of the Canaanites. This is about outward signs that the Israelite believers have a different religion than the people in the land. They are monotheists. We are still monotheists, and this was supposed to be a way to symbolize outwardly their monotheism. So while the Canaanites would wear blended uh, clothing, they would put two different kinds of seeds in, they would plow with two different kinds of animal, this was deliberately intended to be an outward sign that they were different. And that difference, the monotheism, uh, persists today. So just because uh, you know, it's cotton and nylon or, you know, polyester blend or whatever, uh, isn't necessarily a reason not to listen. Uh, I think there's other reasons not to, but it's not this one. Another silly angle, the uh, new and improved God. Ah, it's the Old Testament. Jesus, we got a better character, better testament, and we follow him now. Okay, so... There is some truth to the idea that we are under a new covenant now. There's a covenant that was made with Jesus that is a new covenant. And therefore, part of the, uh, the framework, the way that God dealt with humanity under a previous covenant, covenant excuse me, is not still in play. But just calling it the Old Testament, the, there's a couple problems with that. What did Jesus say about the Old Testament? We want to listen to Jesus and say, we follow Jesus. Okay, do we have Jesus' view of Scripture? Have you not read what God spoke to you in the Scriptures? What Scriptures is he talking about? He's not talking about 2 Thessalonians. It wasn't going to be written for another you know, decade or two. Probably one decade, close to one, eh, one and a half. Uh, so if we follow Jesus, what Jesus was talking about was, have you not read what God spoke to you? in the scriptures. So the scriptures to him were the Old Testament. Have you not read the speech of God? He regarded it as the very speech of God in there. So if we're following Jesus, are we listening to the way that Jesus approached his scripture? Please, 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 please don't think God just preserved the Old Testament for God. Furthermore, Jesus quoted, um, you know, there's that line, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and I, I know, we know that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. However, if you would like to turn to your Bibles, if you would turn to Leviticus uh, chapter 19, you 
we'll find in one of these verses. as yourself. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Okay. So, do we just throw that out because that's Old Testament? Well, that's something that Jesus quoted quite a lot. So, we can't just say it's in the Old Testament. We have to have a reason why. We have to have, you know, and what will come out of this series, a covenantal reason why we may say that doesn't apply to us today. Then one more. God's not cool anymore. That's just a silly superstition. The world's advanced beyond that. Look, everybody wears blended fabric now. There's no negative consequences. It's just a silly rule for silly superstitious people. Uh, so, no. Uh, this is a doctrinal point. If God really is all-powerful and really is all-knowing, God can't be not up on the times. That's not how this works. God knows all of the struggles that we go through. God knows about anything that we say, oh, we know something now that they didn't know back then. Well, God knew, if God is who he says he is. So really, if you make a claim that this is just an old superstition, you'd have to undermine God's ability to know, at that time, how the world worked. So if God is our God, we listen to God despite what the culture says. So these are just some interpretive angles that I don't think we should apply when trying to adjudicate the question of can we wear blended fabric clothing given the prohibition that takes place in the Bible. Uh, what is the answer? Uh, short answer, there's no standard prohibition on multi-fiber clothes for Christians. Why? I've kind of alluded to this thus far uh, a few times. This rule was applied under a different covenant. It was applied specifically under the Sinai covenant, and that covenant is not in place today. We as Christians are not under the purview of the Sinai Covenant. There are parts of the Sinai Covenant that have been doubled down on by Jesus, and there are other parts, uh, one of them being like the eating of unclean foods, you might remember from the Gospel of Mark, thus he made all foods clean. Uh, that was pretty clear. Some of the temple rituals as well, well there's no temple anymore. Uh, there's a lot of reasons uh, why the Sinai Covenant is no longer in effect, even though certain precepts have endured to the New Covenant, uh, but this is not one of them. This was one of the uh, ones that has since been uh, overtaken in the New Covenant. If you want all the reasoning, the whole long chain of reasoning for that, um, come to week three of the class uh, at the First Presbyterian Church of River Forest, or hang tight for the video that will come up afterwards uh, of the slides for that class, and you can get the whole uh, discussion of it. So, one other assumption, too, before we get into the guidelines for reading the Bible the Bible has a single, unified narrative. You might hear me say the term meta-story. I will try not to do that, uh, but if I do, that's what it means. Uh, and just look at this. There's 66 books. There's 40 different authors. There's a thousand years, roughly, for the composition, but all one story? This is incredible. Uh, but that's what you see when you read through the whole Bible. You know, Exodus presupposes Leviticus. Uh, excuse me, presupposes Genesis. Leviticus presupposes what happened in Exodus and Genesis. Uh, Leviticus makes no sense. Uh, what did the Levites do in the temple? If you don't have, or excuse me, the tabernacle? If you don't have what happened in Exodus as the backdrop to that. The covenant of Jesus makes no sense without understanding the Messianic prophecies and the Davidic covenant. All of this is a single unified narrative. The exile being part of the disobedience of the people under the uh, auspice of the Sinai Covenant. And so the exile being part of the covenant curses related to the Sinai Covenant. You don't understand the exile, which we have historical record of, without knowing the theology behind the covenant. Now, most non-believing scholars would dispute <laughs> the dates, the number of authors, a lot of what I just said. Uh, but again, the primary basis for their disagreement is presuppositional. Uh, we can talk more about that 
but the tent doesn't stand up. When you take that uh, point of view, it's just not going to, it's not going to play out. It's not going to work. Uh, so the Bible has a single unified story. The covenants are going to be the thing behind that story as your markers for how is God dealing with humanity at these different points in time. And so that's what the sermon series is going to help with, is really digging into those markers. Okay, so guidelines for reading the Bible. This is going to underlie the work that we do. Uh, so we're really going to be getting into a lot of examples here, um, but I'm going to list them out right here. Read whole passages. Read whole passages. We'll get into that more, but I feel very passionately about that one. Know the context, both historical context and the literary context. So what's going on historically, and then literary, uh, where does the unit fit within the book? Where does that book fit within larger biblical theology? What's Who's the author? What's the intent of the author at the time? This is in particular important for the epistles, where you literally are reading somebody else's mail, and you've got to try and reconstruct with the little stuff that you have in the Bible what was going on. And when I'm just reading one message in a string of correspondence, how do I understand where this message fits on in their context, in their shared context, being part of that history and part of that um, chain of messages. Uh, identify the genre. Genre is very important in understanding how to approach a passage. Do you approach it straightforwardly or do you approach it uh, truly metaphorically? There are some things that are to be understood metaphorically or uh, poetically. Uh, paying attention to where the Bible interprets itself for you. This happens sometimes. Uh, there is the voice of the narrator and if you believe that these scriptures are complete and correct in their original writing, that includes the comments of the narrator. So there's a few places where things are more straightforward than when the narrator just tells you what's happening. Uh, also extended prayers or statements from approved persons, uh, some people that the Bible speaks very highly. Uh, and then lastly, uh, using multiple translations, uh, which is really helpful if you're trying to really get to the bottom of what is this passage saying. So, uh, point zero, read whole passages. You could probably tell if I'm saying point zero, it comes before even point one, uh, punctuating each word, how strongly I feel about this. Uh, what I mean by this is read the literary unit that the passage belongs to in order to understand what the author's trying to do in, in this particular point in time. So chapters and verses were added in the 1200s. They were there's not a divine table of contents. There's not inspired chapters and verses. Uh, they're not always logical. Sometimes a verse is two words. Sometimes it's like a paragraph. Uh, the first creation account, the initial account of creation, uh, which ends at the seventh day, ends at Genesis 2, 3, not at chapter 1. Uh, so just even following chapters and verses isn't always delineating for you uh, literary units. Uh, and, you know, the way I want to put it is, what book have you ever approached where, you know, on a day, you turn to page 200, you read a couple sentences, and then you're like, I wonder what that means for my life. And then the next day you turn to page 32 and you read a paragraph. And you're like, oh, I wonder what that means. You know what I'm going to do? You know, tomorrow I'm going to read the beginning. I'm going to read like the first paragraph again. I've read that paragraph so many times. I know what that means. Would you do that with Pride and Prejudice? Uh, would you do that with any of the Harry Potter books? You might do that with an encyclopedia. You might do that with a cookbook. Uh, you might do that with the book of Proverbs uh, or the wisdom literature. Uh, but if the Bible is what I said before, a story, and I truly believe it is, I think it's very difficult to argue that if there isn't a consistent story arc, then it's more like you're opening up a novel and you're attempting to extrapolate some conclusions by just, you know, I'm going to say, because they abandoned the Lord God of their ancestors who brought them out of the land of Egypt, they clung to other gods and worshipped and served them. Because of this, he brought all this ruin on them. Okay, what do we do? That's your devotional for the today. Uh, you know, we, that's not how you should approach a story. Uh, you want to at least understand what's the literary unit. Is there a poem? Is there a parable? Is there a particular part of the argument? For goodness sake, Paul's letters are one big argument a lot of the time. Romans, for sure. Um, others, like 1 Corinthians, have actually little vignettes in there. 
Now, concerning what you wrote me about, concerning this, concerning that, concerning that. So you can read those more in isolation. There are some books, like uh, Ecclesiastes, like uh, James, the uh, Proverbs, that truly are broken up as uh, you know something you can take little snippets out of. Go to town. Uh, there is a little bit of form and structure in Proverbs and some in Ecclesiastes and some in James, but you can treat it as uh, more wisdom literature where it's not necessarily inappropriate to pull little bits out of it. Uh, whereas to do something like that for like, the Gospel uh, or for Romans is uh, particularly difficult. Revelation, goodness gracious. Uh, so the Bible is not a cookbook, it's not a book of rules, it's a story. Treat it as such. Uh, for example, here's another one I got for you. My preaching is useless and so is your faith and we're found to be false witnesses of God. That's the Apostle Paul. Straight from the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 15. Look it up. This guy, he admits, it's a sham. Your faith's useless. My preaching's useless. We're false witnesses. Um, most, if not all of you, know that I have taken this out of context on purpose to make a point. Uh, if Christ is not raised, my preaching is useless and so is your faith. Uh, so, you know, don't split the text up. Read the passage. Uh, what I do a lot of the time, I think I'll mention this on a future slide, but what I do a lot of the time is uh, to try and figure out where these units begin and end. I'll read the chapter before, the chapter including the passage I'm looking at, and the chapter afterwards. Uh, that'll kind of give me a little bit of an idea of what the roadmap is. And is my literary unit contained within here? Uh, look at Psalm. You know, a Psalm, you actually can probably take the Psalms uh, on their own for the most part. Uh, is there a poem within there, like uh, Judges chapter 4, where you've got Deborah's song, where you can actually you know, take a look at that? Uh, or is there something like Romans, where if I'm really going to you know, open a chapter 7 uh, and try and pull a few verses out, you know, it just it's going to take you all the way back uh, to really put each part of Romans into context because it just builds on itself. Uh, so that that's just some advice for how to figure out what your literary unit is. All right, the next point, context. So when I say context, I mean, so what's going on historically? Um, who's the intended audience? What are their concerns? It's the author's intent. It's the literary context, what came before and after the passage. So it just like reading whole passages, it does fall into context. It's a very similar idea. Context is broader. Uh, I just feel very passionately to pull that one out specifically and spend a lot of time on it. Uh, so this can seem kind of daunting, uh, but the Bible actually gives you this information more often than you think. Uh, use your footnotes to find cross-references. I uh, put together an example to show you, uh, especially so for the New Testament, uh, if you're looking at the letters of Paul, you can find a lot of correspondence in the letters of Paul to events that take place in Acts. Uh, it's like hyperlinked, almost. And some Bibles are great in cross-referencing between that. Um, so if we look at 1 Corinthians, uh, and I want to know something like, all right, what's the, what's the context behind this? Uh, so Acts chapter 18 actually describes the founding of the Corinthian church. So Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila, who'd recently been expelled from Rome. Um, and so if you even if you really wanted to dig into it, you could say, interesting that they were expelled from Rome. It even goes as far as to talk about uh, the particulars behind that expulsion. Uh, so if you go to Acts chapter 18, I'm on 19 right now, and I uh, say, so after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who'd recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Uh, so interestingly, right there, there's a historical claim. That's something if you wanted to say, okay, is the Bible making stuff up, or is it, uh, is it making true claims? You could say, did Claudius order the Jews out of Rome? Sure enough, Claudius did. Uh, you just do a quick Google search and find out. You know, that was between 41 and uh, 54 AD when that took place. So now that's placing historically, and you know that at least uh, the conditions that some of them were under uh, in Corinth is that they were Romans. They were from Rome, and they were expelled from Rome. These are the Jewish believers who would be at the synagogue. 
Um, so Paul stayed for 18 months, and he converted Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. Uh, Paul was tried and found not guilty of, uh, actually there's a, there's a good point. I don't even uh, necessarily see right here what exactly it was. Oh yeah, this man, they said, persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. Uh, so that was his charge. He was found not guilty. He left for Ephesus in 191. And then Apollos became the leader in Corinth. Paul is actually writing from Ephesus. So he founds the church in Corinth, and then he goes to Ephesus. And then you can see in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, that he was writing to the Corinthians from Ephesus. So you roughly know, he had just founded the church. He's in Ephesus right now. Uh, and he had written them before. So you can see in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, uh, that they've had correspondence. And he's specifically responding to uh, particular things that they wrote him about. How do we know what those are? Well, because he said now concerning marriage, uh, virgins, which I misspelled, uh, food sacrifice to idols, spiritual gifts, collection for the saints, and a visit from Apollos. So now we can kind of reconstruct what the Corinthians were uh, asking him about. We know sort of what's on their minds. Uh, here's another example. Oh. Excuse me. Here's another example. Jeremiah 29. Here's an example for you, you at home. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. I know the plans I have for you, plans for, to prosper you and not to harm you. We've heard this one a lot. So here's the question. Here's the question to try and answer from uh, in context. Who is you? Who's the you in this passage? It's in there. You can find it. So if you would like to go look for yourself, um, go ahead and pause the video, look around. And if you'd just like to hear the answer right now, here it comes. So in chapter 29, verse 1, this is the text of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exiles, the priests, the prophets, and all the people of Nebuchadnezzar had deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jeremiah is sending this letter to those in exile. Jeremiah was not uh, part of the exile. He was able to get out. Uh, so he's writing a letter to those in exile in Babylon. And this phrase right here, this sentence that we've said to ourselves uh, a lot, it's a mantra of it in evangelicalism. Uh, I know the plans I have for you. This whole thing is part of this letter that Jeremiah sent to the exiles. So let's see, what's, uh, what's he saying? Four through seven. Build houses, plant gardens, take wives, seek welfare, multiply yourselves. Don't be deceived by those who are deceiving you. Because you're going to be here for 70 years and it's no accident because God's going to be faithful. Jeremiah is writing to exiles who are very discouraged. They're actually thinking it's basically all over. There's no reason why should we carry on. And... You know, if we got into uh, the context of the Sinai Covenant, there's a lot of reasons to believe that in some sense they were being abandoned. Uh, and Jeremiah is trying to say, no, God has a plan for you, Israel. God is going to continue to have a plan for you, Israel. The context of this is to try and say God is going to continue to be faithful to the promises that he made. I would argue the promises to Abraham. Uh, and therefore, Israel is going to be okay. And there's going to be some time. They're going to be in exile a while. So you're also not going to get sprung from jail anytime soon. You might as well build your house, plant your garden, you know, marry, have kids, seek the welfare of yourselves and others. Uh, and don't listen to the doomed prophets. So the point is, don't push the passage farther than it goes. You might miss what the passage is really trying to say. Uh, God does promise to prosper his people that he draws to himself. Uh, but you find that in other places. And if you just read this one right here, and you don't step back to say, what context was this, this set in? Who said it? To whom and why? You don't necessarily see that this is part of the arc of the faithfulness of God to the promises that he made. And we can believe that God will continue to keep his promises because he made promises and kept them in the past. Uh, that's one of the big things we can take away from this passage. 
uh, for help with context. So how do you, okay, so I've picked out some right here and I've shown you how you can, uh, how you can find some of these contextual clues within the Bible. Uh, but how do you do this on your own uh, if you're starting from scratch? My advice, get a commentary. Uh, and uh, I mean like commentary, I mean like this, it's kind of big. Um, it's more than the study notes. Um, study notes are nice markers, um, but if you really are interested in learning all of this stuff and being able to follow uh, what's going on in the text, there are people that God has appointed to spend their lives looking at this stuff and to write massive volumes uh, about each of these books. They do it, they love it, and you can read these books and just see uh, the enormous amount of effort that these scholars have put into this. So get a commentary, but buyer beware, not all commentaries are good. Uh, in fact, I'm going to list a few right here that I think are helpful. Uh, and you can obviously pause and you can read this. I'll go over uh, go over them briefly. But uh, commentaries are written by people in biblical studies, but people in biblical studies are not all uh, believers. They're not all people who would agree with the operating assumptions that I described at the beginning of this video. Uh, some that would, though. So if you want something that's reliably conservative, easy to follow, it's going to give you a lot of context, but it's not going to get super technical. Um, the Tyndale Commentary Series from University Press. Uh, the volumes are actually pretty slim. Uh, they don't go into a ton of like technical Greek. They might get into a little bit. You don't need to know Greek uh, to follow that commentary. Uh, and they tend to do a good job of trying of treating the text like it has something to say. Uh, and we should be trying to ascertain what the text is trying to say. So the Tyndale commentaries are nice in that sense. New American Commentary uh, is also reliably conservative. It is explicitly committed to inerrancy. So everybody who's a commentator in the New American Commentary series has basically said, I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. You can get a little technical. Um, not, not as much as some others that you're going to find. Uh, you do not need to know Greek. You will encounter a little bit more in there than you would in the Tyndale. Uh, but it, in my opinion, it's worth the effort. There's some volumes on uh, New American commentary that are terrific. Uh, NIV application commentary, here's another one, conservative top-notch scholars. Uh, the format's easy to follow. They have, uh, they go into the text and then they talk about bridging context, they talk about applying to today. It's called the application commentary because it's, the purpose of the commentary is to try and get to these questions that we've talked about for the purpose of applying to contemporary. Uh, I will say that this Genesis commentary here, the NIV application commentary by John Walton, uh, I couldn't recommend it higher. Uh, anything John Walton writes on Genesis, I think, is outstanding. Uh, yeah, not very technical. Word Bible commentary, uh, this can get technical. Uh, this one, you can, you're going to get yourself into some Greek and some Hebrew. Volumes are done really well. Uh, some of the Old Testament volumes are not conservative. Uh, the New Testament. Uh, volumes, though, I'm told are reliably conservative. Uh, the Pillar Commentary series, conservative, very detailed. It's going to take you some effort. Uh, if you really want to spend some time in Romans, uh, Colin Cruz's uh, Pillar Commentary on uh, Romans, uh, I highly recommend that. It's very, very worth it if you have the patience. Uh, it's up to date, good scholars. And then uh, the Anchor Bible Commentary, it's hard to not talk about that one. Uh, often liberal. Uh, not always. Uh, Andrew Hill's Malachi volume is actually not. Uh, and it's highly technical. That's kind of the purpose. This one is the gold standard. Um, you may have heard of this one before if you haven't even heard of any other commentary series. Um, but you can't argue with the scholarship that's been put into it. Uh, there's a lot of work that has gone into the Anchor Bible series, and you can find things in there that you won't find elsewhere. Uh, so tread lightly. Uh, there's reason to question some of the historical claims that they make, or the source claims that they make in particular in the Old Testament ones. Uh, you're going to want to be familiar with it. If you're interested in doing graduate work, you're going to want to be familiar with the Anchor series. Um, oh, and one other thing I'll say before I leave. Again, if you're really interested in this, this is like, if you're geeking out like I do over this stuff, 
the best commentary library is one that actually isn't through a commentary series. Uh, you get the best volumes from the different series. So you can actually find online reviews of different series commentaries. And so I have, I own commentaries from multiple series that I think are among the best volumes. Uh, I, you would care a lot more about the author, uh, for instance, than you would necessarily about the series. But you can look at these series. Basically, I'm saying don't, uh, don't just go out and buy a huge set. Um, if you did that for any one of them, I would say the NIV application commentary or the New American would probably be the way to go. But you do, the best library is going to be one that uh, where you get the best volumes from the different series. Because there is a little bit of, there can be quality variation based on the, uh, the authors between the different, uh, the different commentaries within a series. Okay, point two, genre. Uh, you got to care about the genre of what you're reading. If it's narrative, read it plainly. Don't search for a hidden spiritual meaning. Don't allegorize the narrative. Uh, narrative already can sometimes be fantastic enough itself. The resurrection account is a narrative account. Um, read it straightforward. Don't also, if it makes a fantastic claim, try to allegorize it. Oh, Jesus raised spiritually. Nuh uh. That's narrative. You're going to take it straightforwardly. Is it poetry? Uh, you may not know that there is as much poetry in the Old Testament as there is text in the New Testament. Poetry is incredibly important to the Hebrews. Uh, it's a very good place to get theology. Uh, it contains broad, more sweeping characterizations of God and God's relationship to people. Uh, then, you know, our favorite, apocalyptic, the kind of stuff you read in Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation, Job, Left Behind series, visions of monsters, uh, Vision, you know, Jacob's Ladder is sort of in the uh, apocalyptic genre. Uh, understand this is characterized by very vivid imagery of things that the person is speaking about that they've seen, they're recounting, they don't even necessarily understand what it is. Uh, requires a lot of care and interpreting since it's the product of these subjective sorts of experiences. Uh, Here's an example, uh, and I picked this example because there is an interpretation that follows. So in Acts chapter 10, Peter saw heaven open and an object that resembled a large sheet come down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. And in it were all the four-footed animal, animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. And then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, I've never eaten any common and ritually unclean. Again, a second time a voice said to him, What God has made must not call common. This happened three times, and then it was taken up into heaven. Okay, it's weird. It's a sheet with all the creatures of the world coming down, um, but you get the vision interpreted for you. So in the verses prior to this, you see the introduction of a new character, Cornelius, an upright, God-fearing Roman centurion. He prays. He's told to go find this guy named Peter. He sends some messengers to find Peter. Peter's met by Cornelius' men, and he joins them for dinner. Now, Peter starts to realize the purpose of this vision, which is about food. Peter said, You know it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit with a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person common or unclean. That's why I came without any objection I was sent for, so I asked, Why did you send me? So he's understanding, he's bridging the context there between the crazy vision that he had, and the situation he's now in with the centurion. So Cornelius says it was God's messenger who told him to do so. And then Peter began to speak, Now I really understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him does righteousness is acceptable to him. Uh, and this is a new covenant kind of idea. Uh, but we get this bizarre apocalyptic vision interpreted for us by the text. Uh, so... There is definitely allegorizing going on there. Excuse me. Uh, you wouldn't read it the same way you'd read narrative. Understanding the genre allows us to see that for what it is and then understand the application. Don't be this guy. Uh, I found this one online just as I was looking around and I couldn't help. I've abridged it a little bit, but here's a, here's a claim that uh, some guy actually made to uh, John Carter who I actually don't know anything about John Carter, uh, but he wrote this thing and I love the story. So, 
Uh, he's quoting a guy who said, I'm here to tell you, sir, that the Earth is not round, regardless of what you and your scientists say. No, the Earth is not round, and I can prove it. Then he shared his reason for his adamant proposition. The Bible says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the Earth. Since the Bible is true, the Earth is not round, it is a square. Um, it's not that he quoted the Bible incorrectly. Uh, oh, sorry. It's not that he quoted the Bible incorrectly. Uh, this was taken from Revelation. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow in the earth, nor in the sea, nor in any tree. This is a genre mistake. This is reading apocalyptic as narrative, reading it straightforward, and saying, okay, the Bible has made a propositional claim about uh, the nature of geology, and uh, Therefore, we must believe it. Uh, if you don't make the genre mistake, you don't sound silly like this. Uh, and you don't start thinking of conspiracy theories about satellites. Uh, so pay attention to the genre. These next few are going to go a little bit quicker. Uh, so point number three, editorial comments. Uh, the voice of the narrator is very wise. In an inerrant book, the narrator will be inerrant. Uh, and the narrator is going to be very straightforward. So. Uh, they're afraid of the book of Judges, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. You don't even necessarily know what the evil is. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But the narrator says, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, you can take that to the bank. By the way, don't aim for that. You don't want that to be the comment on you. Uh, here's another one. First uh, Chronicles 10. Saul, king of Israel, Saul died for his unfaithfulness to the Lord because he did not keep the Lord's word. He even consulted a medium for guidance, but he did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse. Well, that settles that. Uh, this is the voice of the narrator giving you the interpretation of the events, the events that took place. Uh, in that, in particular, it's telling you if there's any ambiguity, Saul's consultation of a medium didn't go over well. Uh, didn't end well for Saul. So, if uh, there's theological comment that comes from these editorial comments, and if you find them, pay attention. They're going to be the most straightforward things that you find in the whole Bible. Oh, that's unfortunate. Something has happened to uh, to my presentation here. Um, I wonder if I could fix that relatively quickly. Let's see here. I don't know even how that happened. But if we do a little bit refresh here, let's do that. And if we then let's remove that. Let's add it back. Technical difficulties, one second. the silly interpretive angles. That's my favorite part. I don't know about you guys. But, all right, and we are fixed. Okay. Extended prayers from approved persons. Uh, a good place to get your theology. Long statements from the people that the Bible identifies as good. That's a good place to go. Um, Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus are examples of approved persons. Uh, John chapter 17, high priestly prayer, uh, the prayer from Jesus to the Father about his purpose and mission. This is an inter-Trinitarian conversation that we are given insight into some of the most intimate communication within the Trinity. Uh, pay attention to that. That's going to be a good place to get your theology. Uh, length of a particular comment tends to be uh, a sign of approval in the Bible. Things that it disapproves of, you tend to contract a little bit more. Not necessarily true. Um, but when Moses has a lot to say, pay attention. When David has a lot to say, pay attention. He's a man after God's own heart. Uh, when you know Jezebel has something to say, you can probably leave it alone. Uh, point five, know what the text assumes you know. So this is 
may be a little interesting to some that the text might assume that you know something. But uh, if the Bible is one protracted narrative, you can't jump into the middle of the story. The Jews were very, very familiar with their own history and their literature. The New Testament presupposes the Old Testament. The New Testament makes no sense without the Old Testament. Otherwise, characters are popping out of nowhere. You've got these people in Israel. They're occupied by the Romans. Why all this matters? Who knows? What's this Messiah? What's this promise? Who knows? Second Adam? Second Moses? What the, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you need to know that context. Uh, Jesus' followers knew that context. They were living that context. And so you have to understand the Old Testament, I believe, to fully understand the New Testament. Yes, that takes work. But like I said, that's why you're here. If you if you didn't feel like working, you wouldn't be in the Bible geese. Uh, and then the last one, so using multiple translations. Uh, so this is helpful if you want to get to the bottom of something. You read a passage, you read where you're like, I'm not really sure if I know what's going on here. Uh, Bible translations can help you. you know, they have different philosophies. Um, and so the different angles on the text can be helpful in triangulating what's going on. Let me say one thing here. Uh, we have enough English translations. Uh, we don't need more. But the English translations are good. Uh, you don't really need to understand the Bible, to understand what's going on. You don't need to know Greek. You don't need to know Hebrew. Uh, you need to know that if you want to be a scholar. Uh, you don't need to know that if you want to be a, a lay person to understand the Bible. That stuff, the English translations have done a terrific job. Uh, you get, though, a different point of view on the text, though, based on uh, what kind of translation you choose. So some of them are literal word for word, trying to relate the words exactly as they were written. And then there's some that I'll call meaning for meaning, which brings the context when translating the literal words would obscure the meaning for contemporary people. And before you think that a literal word for word is going to be just strictly better, uh, if we look at like, Matthew 9.36, so when Jesus saw the crowds, he had, insert Greek word here, uh, uh, for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, so what is this word? Well, if you want a literal, so splachnus somai, uh, the root splachnon, uh, anybody who's watching this who does know Greek is probably cackling right now. Uh, I have not taken Greek. Uh, so it literally refers to the inner parts and bowels of a person or an animal, your entrails. So when he saw the crowds, he had entrails for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, universally, this is translated differently. It is translated as empathy or compassion. Uh, when used in its metaphorical sense, as it is being used here, uh, then that's what it means. So you're going to see the Bible is translated, he had compassion for them. So you know, your translators are helping you. Uh, why, by the way, did they say inner parts and bowels? Uh, so it was a deep feeling in his gut. You know that feeling. Uh, and also ancient people, and I believe even classical, I could be wrong on this, uh, believe, believe that cognition took place in the gut. Uh, the brain was useless. You see, you know, remember Egyptian mummies, hook goes up the nose, take the brain out, but all of the intestines, all the guts were well preserved. That's where they thought you know, cognition took place. Uh, they revered that, and their words reflected their understanding of how uh, you know, the body worked. So, uh, now that said, you know, word for word also, if you preserve like Greek word order, like a few translations do, it's really difficult to understand. Uh, so there's always some interpretation in translation. But then you could go far the other direction where you're paraphrasing the meaning so much that it ceases to be even a translation. It's just, you know, what the story that you think the Bible is telling. So something like the message, for instance, uh, would not be any good for any kind of true Bible study. Uh, it might be a way to read and understand Eugene Peterson's ideas behind what the Bible says. Uh, that's what it's good for. It's not good for any kind of uh, true study. So I don't know where who what the origin is of this graphic here, but this graphic is a good one that actually goes and shows 
uh, the spectrum of most of the English translations. So you have the most literal interlinear would be uh, the one that I mentioned where you're just translating the word literally and you preserve the word order. Uh, and then paraphrase, which doesn't even count as a translation, that's where you find the message. Uh, so my suggestion is if you wanted to study a passage, really get into it, uh, you're going to use one from over on the word for word side. Uh, leave the interlinear alone unless you're uh, unless you have some knowledge of Greek or Hebrew. Don't bother with the interlinear. Or if you're doing uh, like graduate exegesis, then you can, you can give that. Um, so something like New American Standard, um, English Standard Version, definitely RSV. Uh, I if you want. Uh, it's just kind of, the, the language is tough. It's like the KJV. The language is, uh, is tough in those. Um, so using one from over there, you know, I will use the New American Standard. Uh, then one from this middle section here. I wouldn't go further to the right here than NIV with the exception of the New Living Translation. Uh, so if you want to have one, you know, New American Standard here, and then pick Holman or the New Revised Standard. Uh, both of those, I, I use both of those regularly. Um, NIV is fine as well. Uh, and then when you get close to this paraphrase side, they start to lose their utility if you want to study the text. If you, and, and even once you get to the right of the NLT, you're even starting to lose uh, the meaning in the text. It's becoming so paraphrased, in my opinion. Uh, the NLT, the old NLT, uh, previous to the, the recent update that they did, used to be in that category as well. Uh, newer version, though, than any NLT you're going to buy today, uh, actually very well done. Uh, it, it counts as a translation. It was built on the Living Bible, which was not any kind of translation. The initial version of the NLT did not count really much as a translation. The new one, the one that you buy today, I actually think is uh, a great companion to have with a very literal word-for-word so if you have a word for word, something in this thought for thought, and uh, you know anything a little closer to the right, um, like the NLT, that's a good way to try and triangulate the meaning. Uh, so anyway, those are kind of the, the foundations, the guidelines for reading and interpreting the Bible. Like I said, people spend their lives on this. They spend a whole the lifetime. Uh, and so this is only an introduction, but Hopefully doing, uh, going through this is helpful, gives you food for thought in your Bible reading, and hopefully you can uh, help put some of these things into practice. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching.